Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us this lunchtime uh, for this webinar on the Accessible Information Regulations and Support Grant for Bus Operators. I'm Tim Rivett, uh, and I'm your host for today's session, and I'll be running through the regulations and the uh, and the grant with you. We are recording this, and we'll share the uh, the recording with you. Uh, in the next couple of days along with the slide deck uh, so you can uh, share it with people that can't join us live uh, or uh, people that uh, you know, or if you want to review what we've said um, feel free to use the chat as I'm going through to put in um, any questions and things like that uh, there's a couple of slots during the uh, during the session today for uh, for questions and things like that and i can pick them up then and we can go uh, interactive as well if uh, if we want so today i'm going to talk to you about why the regulations have been brought in uh, look at the regulations and then uh, we'll have a bit of a q a um and they on the regulations and then look at the support grant uh, and again, uh, some time for questions. So why have the accessible information regulations been brought in? Um, there's a lot of anxiety for a lot of people who travel, particularly if they've got uh, a visual impairment, they've got uh, problems with their hearing, um, if you've got cognitive and learning impairments, um, the lack of information about where you are and, and where you're heading uh, can make travelling by bus or coach a very anxiety inducing experience. Um, a survey by the Guide Dogs for the Blind in 2014 um, identified that over 70% of visually impaired respondents had missed their stop because the driver forgot to tell them where to get off. Understandable. Um, and drivers have a lot to do, um, so it's uh, it's inevitable they're going to forget to uh, to tell somebody um, at some point. Um, and 68% um, said they would use buses more frequently if audio visual announcements were provided on board. Um, and that's a really important statistic for me because um, typically people with uh, disabilities of any sort make fewer journeys and often the bus is the only uh, option for them because they're uh, unable to drive for example so being able and being confident enough to use more buses more frequently uh, is really important um, for those of you that have been to London in the last 15 years or so you will have seen audiovisual announcements on the vehicles down there and if you've traveled on new rolling stock since 1998 you will have come across it um, where it's been a requirement on the rail for new rolling stock for a good number of years now um, if we look at um, what's happened um, with adoption of audiovisual so far um, looking at the 22-23 figures, which are the last that are available from the Department of Transport. Um, in England, uh, just under half of vehicles had some form of audiovisual. Uh, if you take London out of the equation, that's just under 30%, Wales 37%, Scotland 35%. So there's a long way to go with people installing audiovisual equipment on vehicles. And because of that, the department back in 2017 as part of the um, open data regulations initially um, consulted on introducing uh, some regulations that would mean that operators had to um, fit the uh, equipment um, and that took a little while to get through to uh, actual regulation but the regulations were uh, agreed by Parliament in March last year, so just over uh, a year ago. 
So what do the regulations say? They require pretty much every local bus or coach service to provide audible announcements and visual information, identifying some key bits of information. Uh, so the route and the direction, uh, the next stop and diversion information and uh, another useful uh, information. Um, it's applicable to buses and coaches operating local services in England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, there are a number of exemptions uh, which we'll have a uh, bit of a look at. Um, but the key bit is operating local bus services. Um, so uh, rail replacement uh, sometimes comes into uh, scope of the regulations where, for example, uh, half of some of the stops are um, only a short distance apart. And if it wasn't for the fact they would be rail replacement, they would be covered under local bus service regulations. So, you know, if you've got a local stop in train service that's got rail replacement on, then that's going to be in scope of the regulations. But a rail replacement that goes from Newcastle to Leeds to London isn't because the distances between stops are too great. So as I say, there's some uh, exemptions. These are pretty standard exemptions that are used in different bits of public service regulation. Um, so things like the size of vehicle, so small vehicles, 17 seats or under, uh, you don't need to fit anything. Um, if you've got a heritage vehicle from before 1973, um, home, closed door, home to school services, long distance services, the normal sort of um, things. Um, key one is that in community bus services, so section 22s, where the uh, services provided using a vehicle that was first used after October last year, um, you do need to um, have uh, audio visual equipment. If it was first used before that, then you don't. So um, the requirements are being phased in over a period of time rather than expecting the industry to uh, do a big bang. Uh, you know, there's what, 20 odd thousand vehicles in scope of the regulations, somebody uh, said. Um, so um, a new vehicle after October this year, you've got to have it installed and operating from first use. Uh, and I should say that's first use uh, for all of these. Uh, it's first use when that vehicle was first used on a local public service. So you might have acquired a vehicle from another operator. It's not when you first used it, it's when the vehicle was first used. So uh, sometimes that might need a little bit of, uh, of tracking back. Um, if you've got a vehicle that's going to be five years old in October, then you need to have it fitted by October. Um, and if you've got an older vehicle, um, you've got until 2026 to install it. So two years, but that will go pretty quick. Um, some vehicles, um, as we've already seen with market adoption, have already got audio visual equipment installed. Um, if you don't meet the full requirements of the regulations, uh, then those vehicles will be classed as partially compliant. Um, and so where you've got a vehicle with equipment that was installed before October last year, you can claim partially compliant. Um, and if that doesn't quite meet all of the regulations, you're OK, but you do need to bring that vehicle up to standard by October 2031. Um, you've got to be providing both audio and visual information. If you've just got a screen and nothing comes through the speakers, then um, that's not good enough. Likewise, if it comes through the speakers and you haven't got 
um, uh, screens. Um, you need to fix screens. Um, so um, what does <clears throat> the regulations require? It requires you to provide audio information um, that has to cover half or at least half of the seated passengers, um, both uh, lower and upper deck if you've got a double decker, um, and that's got to be of a level that is intelligible to people. So it's no good it being um, unintelligible because of the um, noise of the uh, of the engine and that sort of thing. So to try and set some rules and quantify that, um, we're saying three decibels above the background noise, um, but no louder than 84 decibels. Uh, so where does the 84 decibels come from? Um, that's because that's the health and safety at work uh, limit where anything above that you need with where somebody's got long term exposure, you need to be providing uh, hearing uh, protection devices. So the last thing you want is to have to uh, equip your drivers with uh, with uh, uh, noise suppressing headphones and things like that. Um, so uh, so that's why the 84 decibels. Um, testing of that um, is recommended that that's done at five and 20 miles an hour. Um, and uh, you know, if you've got a vehicle uh, that's operated in a hilly area and perhaps older, then um, uh, the three decibels above the background noise um, could be quite high volume um, because uh, you know the noise of an older diesel engine going uphill um, can be uh, quite loud sometimes. Um, as well as providing it in a way that um, people without hearing impairment can hear. So through speakers, um, you need to be providing it through a hearing loop. Um, you will have probably seen uh, hearing loop signs, T-switch signs uh, on all sorts of places in shops and banks and, and places like that. Um, same uh, approach. Um, and same technology that's used there, you put that onto a bus um, and you need to be providing that in at least the priority and wheelchair space um, and provide signage for the areas that you're covering. Um, ideally, you'd provide it around the whole uh, vehicle floor plate, so that's up and uh, down stairs, but the minimum requirement is priority and wheelchair space. Um, one of the reasons that the, it's ideally wider is because if you've got a hearing impairment, that is very much a um, non-visible impairment. And um, a lot of people that have got uh, hearing aids with uh, T loops um, will sit anywhere on the vehicle and not want to take up uh, priority seating, for example. Um, but um, retrofitting hearing loops is not the uh, easiest thing to do, um, which is why there's the uh, the minimum requirement in there. So you've got to provide audio. Um, you've also got to provide uh, visual coverage for, again, uh, half of your passengers upstairs and downstairs. Um, most of the time, that's not going to be too much of a problem, but you might have a, uh, a double decker um, with seating in a, uh, ahead of the uh, the stairwell and things like that. Um, and so uh, you need to, uh, to have a think about that for some vehicles. Um, it's got to be uh, large enough to see. And so there's a minimum character height. Um, Obviously, if you can provide bigger than that, then great. Um, and there are um, more detailed uh, expectations about think about the, uh, the the text. So, for example, you shouldn't be using all capitals because that's hard to read. You should be uh, should be using mixed case. You should have uh, proper descenders. 
um, rather than it all being um, on the level. Um, so there are some uh, some more detailed rules around that. If you've got vehicles that are first used after October this year, so you might have got vehicles on order, um, they are going to need to have a display that's visible to wheelchair users when they're in their wheelchair space, which often will mean that they're rearward facing. Um, and so therefore, in that case, they're probably not going to be able to see the display that is configured for forward facing passengers. So you're going to need to provide a additional um, forward facing display for those wheelchair users. Um, there is no requirement to use any particular technology. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's TFT or LED or e-ink or, or whatever takes your fancy as long as it can meet the uh, the requirements. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, and so um, sometimes some of the vehicles that have been fitted with displays for uh, wheelchair users, sometimes those are LED when the other one is TFT. You can mix and match. Um, if you want, um, some operators are going, well, we're going to provide the same sort for everybody, um, taking on board uh, equality to the uh, to the fuller extent. So that's what you need to be able to provide. What do you actually need to provide in terms of content? You need to provide route information. Uh, so uh, the name or the number of the the bus route and where it's going, if it's circular, which way around the circle it's going or or some other um, identifier that's going to help somebody know um, whether they're on the right vehicle going the right way. Um, and um, that needs to be um, consistent with other sources of information that the passenger might have. So if they've planned a journey online or looked at a uh, printed timetable at stop or somewhere else, um, they've got to be able to recognise that what the vehicle that they're getting on is going in the right to the right place and uh, the right direction. Um, and um, people boarding need to be able to hear that to know that uh, that it's the right vehicle. Um, when you uh, get to um, the last stop, passengers need to be alerted that it's the end of the route um, and therefore uh, they should uh, exit the vehicle. Um, you need to tell people what the next stop is along the route. Um, that is every stop, whether or not you're um, going to be stopping there. Um, and that needs to be uh, announced uh, at or after you've left the uh, last stopping point. So, you know, next stop is. Um, and you need to think about the timing of that information with your supplier um, because um, it needs to be announced in enough time for somebody to think, ah, that's the stop I want, um, and press the bell and the driver to stop safely. We don't want it coming at the last minute and drivers having to uh, do emergency stops and things like that. Um, if you've got long distances between stops so you're out in a in a rural location for example then um, you might need to think about uh, repeating that message as you are approaching a stop you know if you've got two or three minutes between stops for example um, uh, you might want to have that next stop announcement 30 seconds before you get to the stop rather than uh, just as you leave the uh, the previous one or you repeat it uh, to help customers. Um, and likewise, if you're in a high speed um, sort of urban environment, 
where you've got stops every you know three four hundred meters and your uh, your vehicle's doing you know 20 30 miles an hour um, you might need to uh, to tweak things a little bit to make sure that there's enough time uh, for the announcements to complete um, and again like destination um, it's got to be recognizable and consistent um, I would encourage you to work with your local authorities if you're uh, an operator and authorities to work with your operators um, to get consistency of names across different products and things like that so passengers have some confidence rather than having different things appearing on different outputs. Um, most of you are probably um, involved in a partnership and things like that and so that's probably a very good place to uh, to have those discussions. Um, if you have a section of hail and ride you need to announce the start and end of that hail and ride of course you don't know where you're going to stop along that um, but you need to be telling people that it's starting and ending um, that does need a um, uh, an alert before you you're saying that a bit like the alert at the end of the route and uh, this is not a normal announcement you might want to pay attention that's what the aim of that is um, and if it's a long hail and ride section you might want to think about uh, providing some additional location information as it goes along. Um, you know, uh, we're at the school, we're at a particular crossroads or something like that to help people um, know where they are along that section of Hail and Ride. Um, Diversion information needs to be provided. This is perhaps one of the things that needs the most thought um, and uh, on an ongoing basis, probably the thing that needs the most management. So um, historically, uh, a lot of timetable data, route data hasn't been updated when you've got a diversion. Um, that I think is one of the things that will change as a result of this um, because you know, if you've got a diversion for uh, a few weeks um, you might want to consider updating your information so it's available in the journey planners and, and online and, and that sort of thing um, because then um, it's not actually you know it's, it's a planned diversion you can provide more meaningful information to the customer other than the minimum required which is this bus is going off route going on diversion um, and um, we're back on route um, of course you can't plan for every diversion you're always going to go around a corner and find uh, a burst water main or uh, a traffic collision um, it's closing the road and, and an unplanned diversion um, so you're not going to be able to plan for uh, every situation. Uh, so your drivers are going to need some way of triggering that announcement and you know, pressing a button at either end of it to trigger the announcement or um, making an announcement over the uh, over the PA um, and the system then um, picking that up and putting it on the screen because it's no good just making an audio announcement you need to, or um, putting a message on the display you need to provide it in both audio and visual form uh, to make sure that uh, as many of your passengers can uh, get that information. Um, it's one thing to fit equipment to a vehicle, it's another thing to keep it running um, uh, as well as the uh, the the sort of checks that you're going to need to be making that um, you know is the equipment working is the display working is stuff coming out of the speakers that's relatively easy to do um, you know a driver will uh, be able to check the screen as part of a you know morning walk around for example and they'll notice when the audio stops part way through a route or something like that. 
Um, it's much harder to test for hearing loop unless you've got um, a, uh, a hearing aid yourself with uh, with a T-switch. Um, and so uh, you're going to need to test the hearing loop on a regular basis. Some systems have little LEDs that you can have um, where a driver can see, uh, others don't. Um, and so it's probably a sensible thing to uh, to invest in a um, in a little portable um, receiver. That you plug a pair of headphones into, and you can uh, and you can test it on a regular basis. You're not going to need to test it every day, but you know you might want to think about doing it once a week, once a month, something like that. Um, so that uh, customers uh, don't need to be reporting it to you. Um, you will need a process for reporting and fixing issues. Um, one of the um, things that people that have got systems in place already um, say is customers are quite um, forward at coming forwards when there are problems with stop names, uh, for example, you know, if if the timing of that's not right, if the wrong stop name is used on the route and things like that, um, and so uh, so be prepared for um, collecting and actioning comments from customers, um, and um, you're going to need to make sure that the route on the vehicle is uh, up, kept up to date when you change routes and things like that not as onerous as when you change timetables because the route probably isn't changing as, as often as a timetable is, um, but you are going to need a process to make sure that um, you can uh, uh, keep that up to date. Um, you might well be keeping at least some of that up to date on another system, either a real-time system that you might have, um, a ticketing system or destination blinds, for example. Um, but this isn't something that you can just uh, fit and forget. You are going to need to uh, make sure you're keeping it um, maintained. So um, before we get on to uh, the uh, the grant and the financial support, um, have we got any questions about the regulations? Um, I've got a quick one, Tim. Yep. So um, we're a coach company, so we've only got coaches and we have PSVAR vehicles. PSVAR only applies to 28 seats or larger. So why is the difference between the scope of these regulations? Why is it not consistent with PSVAR? Because you said this is 17 seats or above. That's not consistent with the PSVAR limit, is it? Uh, no, it's not. But this isn't linked to PSVAR. This is, um, you know, this is about providing information to as many people as possible, and that's the uh, that's the level that the department has identified as suitable to uh, to uh, make sure that as many vehicles as possible um, are providing this information to people, um, you know, particularly in rural areas. There's quite a lot of sort of midi-sized vehicles. Um, rather than uh, you know the uh, the the bigger you know forty seat type ones, so uh, I'm thinking that's why that they've uh, they've gone for the uh, the seventeen seat um, to try and rule out the need for mini buses and things like that, but make sure as many as possible are fitted. Um, we've got one in the chat about. Um, any industry best practice guidance to operators about the different capabilities of information systems available, connectivity and control, and the ability to provide dynamic information. Um, so um, if I jump ahead on uh, slides, um, so Artig has a report on audio visual equipment. It doesn't talk about um, hearing loops. Um, but it does go through the different display technologies and what you might think need to think about about back offices and maintenance and um, a project to uh, to install this. What to, you know you need to be uh, thinking about and doing. Um, and so uh, the link will be on the slides that you uh, that you get sent. Um, 
we got any more questions about the regulations? Um, small coach operator based in Aberdeenshire. We currently only have one local authority service run. For those who have retrofitted, is there a database of suppliers, manufacturers fitted for these systems? So um, on the Arctic website, um, we'll look at the link for that um, in a bit. We've got a set of pages about the regulations um, and a bit of a quick guide to them. We've also got a page um, that has got um, some suppliers that uh, have made themselves known to us that um, do provide systems that can be compliant to the regulations um, if you uh, haven't got any ideas to start with. If you're a supplier and you're not on that list and you can provide compliant uh, system, then please do drop me a line because uh, the more the merrier on that list. OK. Um, we will uh, move on then if there's no more. Um, so um, some of you will be, um, oh, we've got um, another one popped up. Is there a specific distance between stops on rail replacement where we will fall under the audio visual requirements? So the requirement is the um, same as for local bus services. So if somebody can uh, pay an individual fare and get on and get off within um, the distance, fails my memory at the moment, 15 miles, is it? Something like that. I'm sure somebody can correct me. Um, have we got an expert on the call? My mind's gone blank on the distance. Pretty sure it's 15, like you said. Yeah, grand. So, yeah. Um, so if you've got stops that close, um, then uh, then you'll be uh, in scope. So um, there is um, a long trailed um, grant for small operators available. Um, the department first announced that there would be um, a couple of years ago before the regulations were uh, out um, because they've recognised the uh, the financial impact of the regulations on small operators. Uh, you know, typically, you might use your vehicles uh, less often than a large operator. Um, you know, you'll be in a rural area, the margins are smaller. And so um, every bit of legislation needs um, an impact assessment. And as part of that impact assessment, uh, it was identified through the uh, discussions that the department were having with the likes of CPT and album and things like that, that um, there would be a significant impact on very small operators. And so uh, there is a £4.6 million grant that Artig have been asked by the department to manage. Um, and uh, that's what we're going to um, uh, go through now. So um, when we talk about smallest operators, we're talking about 20 or fewer um, in scope vehicles. Um, you, know, you might have uh, some some small mini buses and, and things like that that are too small to be in scope. So it's not a hard You've only got, you know, you've got 23 vehicles, you can't apply it. It's, it's in scope vehicles. Um, you've got to uh, not be part of a bigger group and things like that. Um, and the vehicles have got to be used that you um, can apply for the grant for have got to be used on a local service. So you might have vehicles that could be in or would be in scope of um, the regulations if um, you were operating them on a local service, but perhaps you're operating them on a uh, on a closed door home to school service. Um, they count towards your in scope uh, vehicle numbers, um, but the grant is for those vehicles that would be used for local services. Um, Got to be meet all the requirements, you know, 
17 or more seated passengers um, and not already providing both audible and visual um, information. If your vehicle um, is under the partial compliance, so you've got audio and visual, um, you're not eligible to up that to the full specification. Um, this is where you might have a display but no audio or the other way around will um, look at uh, covering the cost of um, the bit that you haven't got. Um, the, um, the grant can be used to buy the equipment, um, and be that speakers, a hearing loop, displays, that sort of thing. Um, but it will cover the minimum specification. So I said that the regulations are technology agnostic um, and it doesn't specify whether you should use LED or TFT, for example. But the grant to make sure it goes as wide as possible um, will fund LEDs, but it wouldn't fund a TFT display. And so um, as part of the process, um, when you get a quote from a supplier, we're asking you to get a quote for um, the minimum specification and then quote for what you uh, want, you know, because you might decide I'm going to put TFTs on vehicle so I can perhaps in future get some local advertising or something like that and get some um, revenue in. Um, we, the grant wouldn't fund the uh, the TFT, but it would fund the uh, the LED. You need to uh, to make up the difference. Um, it'll pay for installation um, and supporting infrastructure. So you know you might need um, some software to manage it in the back office, for example, um, and training that to to use it and things like that. Um, and um, the first year's maintenance. Um, Operators who get the grant will be required to maintain the equipment in an operating um, uh, in operation for five years, um, and uh, there'll be an audit process to make sure you're doing that. If you swap vehicles and things like that, then you'll need to move the kit between vehicles and, and that sort of thing. Um, all of those sort of things are detailed in the uh, in the documentation on the Arctic website. Um, so the the process for applying um, it's pretty simple. Uh, this isn't one way you're going to have to find some consultants and spend um, you know weeks writing war and peace about the pros and cons of various things. This is you get a quote from a supplier. Um, you fill out the online form, you fill out a grant claim form, which will be available in the next day or so on the website. Unfortunately, it's not um, up there at the moment. Um, you fill out a subsidy declaration form. So this will be uh, a minimum financial assistance grant. So if you have uh, other financial assistance from um, local or central government, um, this grant will go towards your three year limit on that. So that's something that you need to uh, keep in mind and get your finance people involved in filling out those numbers um, and uh, agree to the contract terms for the grant. Things like you know, keeping it on your vehicle for, for five years and keeping it maintained and that sort of thing. Um, the grants opened um, on Monday last week uh, and opened for eight weeks, closing on the 3rd of June. Um, and we're hoping for the DFT nod on the grant awards in early July. Um, hopefully there won't be a general election call because whilst it's not a uh, political decision, um, it's a you know it's an operational decision. Civil service tends to uh, to grind to a halt. So just a word of warning with the uh, uncertainty around at the moment. Um, but all being well, decision in early July. Um, and in terms of allocation, um, I've said a number of times it's targeted at the smallest operators. 
Um, and so um, it will be allocated on the basis of smallest first. So you know, an operator with uh, with one vehicle is much more likely to get a grant than uh, than one with twenty because we'll work from the smallest upwards until the uh, until the money runs out. Um, and if there is any money left after um, the uh, the initial round, then uh, we'll do another round of the next tier of operators um, but at the moment um, you know, the scope is uh, is 20 vehicles or fewer. Um, as I say we have a set of pages on the RTIG website rtig.org.uk slash AIG which has got a um, whole series of things about the regulations links to the uh, to the official regulations and and support guidance and things like that we've put together a quick guide to it um, there's a bit about how you apply um, and links to all the documentation and things like that um, we've got a dedicated email address if you've got any questions about the grant um, and um, if you need help with anything, need advice and things like that, then reach out to us on that or um, CPT are well versed in what's going on. Uh, if any of you are CPT members, um, you've probably already heard much of the content that we've been through today because uh, CPT are holding a series of face-to-face uh, -face and online sessions and uh, and we've been uh, involved in uh, in a lot of those um, and we've talked about the report already. Um, so um, it's then um, have we got any questions? Um, so um, Question, will there be a grace period given that the award in July will be no guarantee of installation by October? Um, officially, no, but um, I don't wouldn't expect uh, DVSA inspectors to be um, doing anything uh, too draconian um, if you've not been able to get it installed by October and you are uh, a recipient of the grant. Um, that said, that's my view rather than anything official. Um, the um, CPT at the moment are asking people if they've got problems getting things fitted before um, uh, October. Um, and so if you're a CPT member, you might want to have a conversation with them um, because they're uh, you know, trying to gather some evidence at the moment. OK. Have we got any more questions? We've got the email address um, for you to uh, contact if you've got any questions. If you prefer to talk to somebody, um, feel free to uh, to give us a call. Um, you'll probably get through to my colleague Dave, who's uh, doing a lot of the uh, the Q and A stuff for people. And my email address is on screen, um, but I will direct you to back to the AIG one. Um, if it's an AIG related question. OK, um, if we've got no more questions, then thank you for your time uh, this lunchtime. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.